Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everyone. So uh, it's, uh, thanks for everyone uh, to uh, uh, attend uh, the uh, Yale uh, Innovation Radiology Grand Round. So it's, it's, my, it's our distinct pleasure and honor to have uh, Dr. Sanjay Mistra from a Mayo Clinic. Uh, the, as most of us know, he is a prolific uh, clinician scientist uh, the, uh, in uh, IR. So uh, currently he's a professor of uh, Innovation Radiology, Vascular Surgery, Biochemistry and the Molecular uh, Biology at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the, I believe that the uh, uh, Dr. Misra is a Philly uh, uh, the native, uh, so uh, he did uh, his undergrad at the uh, uh, Drexler uh, Medical School at the uh, Medical School and the Residency at the Hahnemann, and uh, the went to Johns Hopkins uh, for vascular and interventional radiology training. And since uh, he was uh, recruited to and started his academic career at Mayo Clinic, and he's been there ever since. Uh, prolific uh, scientist, uh, uh, the, uh, particularly in the vascular disease, uh, uh, particularly focusing on the uh, dialysis. Uh, the, I believe that the, uh, Dr. Misra has over 160 peer-reviewed articles, uh, active with three auto ones, two of which are PIs, uh, both from uh, uh, the American Heart as well as NIDBK. Uh, has uh, served in the uh, NIH uh, review uh, panels for a decade, uh, the, particularly in the uh, nephrology, um, technology, and the, uh, the surgery uh, service lines. So uh, he is a prolific uh, scientist and a clinician. Uh, today, uh, I'm, I'm uh, really uh, pleased that he will discuss his, his uh, laboratory uh, science findings in stem cell research, uh, particularly pertinent to dialysis, and how it might uh, uh, translate uh, for betterment of our patients in dialysis. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin, for those kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was here, I was trying to remind, uh, I think I interviewed for the fellowship with Dr. Pollock. You probably don't remember me. <laughs> but I'm back. No, I'm kidding. So, no, it's a great pleasure. Uh, there's friends in the audience. And so thank you for uh, allowing me to visit. And, and this talk it's mostly for residents and fellows when i uh set this up uh i wanted to uh ask kevin who i should target and it's really about translation and as i think about stem cells uh, i think about them as a tool as we would any tool in interventional radiology whether it's a catheter a balloon an embolization uh, etc so as you think about stem cells i think the one of the key aspects of them are it's a tool that we can use to deliver anywhere in the body and currently stem cells are used for a lot of things from head to toe. And we're just gonna talk a little bit about uh, where we use them in interventional radiology and talk about a, a clinical trial that I wrote uh, that I'm running as a physician IND sponsored where, and show you some data at the end. So these are my disclosures. Um, I had to give you learning objectives. And if you don't learn this, I apologize, it's my fault, but I'll tell you the answers. Uh, so we can, can I give them the answers now, Kevin, and then we'll be done? Okay, at the end, I'll give you the answers. Remind me. So uh, a little bit about how stem cells work, uh, potential applications in vascular injury, and then imaging, and, and I'm embarrassed because we have very well-known uh, uh, scientists who image cells uh, sitting in the front rows uh, uh, that, that know more about this uh, than I do. Um, so the outline is uh, uh, in three parts, uh, the economic and clinical burden of fistula failure. And as many of you know, uh, President Trump has made ESRD and dialysis a huge initiative. Uh, number two, path, uh, why do uh, ABFs fail? And then number three, why did we use stem cells and how did we get there? So uh, it's always uh, important for us to level set why we do what we do uh, for about 20 years, I must have done 500 fistula grams. I've been doing fistula grams since Hopkins, and that's where I really got interested in this. And the population of end-stage renal disease patients has went up astronomically. It's estimated over 2 million patients have ESRD, uh, 720,000 in the U.S. This has doubled over the last uh, decade. And you really need, uh, in order to do dialysis, you need a catheter, a fistula, or a graft. Uh, uh, for uh, hemodialysis, not peritoneal. And so uh, at our institution and many other places, these are the three different configurations our surgeons will use. Uh, the fistula, AV fistula is on the left. 
uh, direct communication between, uh, it's a, created in the OR where you anastomose the artery to the vein, and then you can have a straight graft or a loop graft. And, and the reason this is used is uh, it's access points to do dialysis. And here's a cartoon uh, sort of showing you how that's done. So uh, currently, this uh, access morbidity uh, costs $3 billion in the US. Uh, we still use a fair bit of grafts. Our graft volumes uh, in Mayo are down. I think we're about 25% or so of our uh, 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 access is about uh, HD grafts. And, and the reason we don't use grafts as much as fistulas are, grafts are more prone to stenosis, thrombosis, and infection. Uh, unfortunately, we, we're now finding out that fistulas are unusable. Uh, up to 60% are unusable six months. And so uh, with the background of this, the, uh, we started to investigate wh why, do, why do these fail and how can we develop therapies uh, to uh, unravel the biology I know Alan Dardick, uh, a very close colleague, is here, and Alan's lab does uh, similar work. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about what does this failure look like. So uh, as you're seeing patients, you'll remember we, uh, in interventional radiology, especially in uh, vascular access, we like to look at estimates for primary patency using Kaplan-Meier estimates. And really what you see is upper extremity fistulas do better than uh, 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 forearm fistulas. And, and then this uh, translates even into graphs. And so this is what the difference looks like. Uh, this is pooled meta-analysis, 54% uh, versus 18% at two, uh, at two years. So a huge difference. And this is one of the reasons why there was an initiative uh, put forth to go to fistula first, uh, uh, imploring and aligning reimbursement for hospitals to put fistulas in first. So you got uh, uh, CMS really bundled in reimbursement uh, to hospitals and to nephrologists as gatekeepers to uh, make sure fistulas were getting placed. And so if you're looking at stenoses that form in fistulas, this is where we'll often get called in. Um, uh, one of the things that happens is they fail often right at the anastomosis. And this is really important uh, and I think it's probably the most important area when you're doing a dilation or an angioplasty or even a clinical trial, because it's really very common. Um, so cephalic arch is uh, obviously very common, but any stenosis can occur anywhere uh, from the uh, artery to the inflow artery, in this case, the subclavian artery to the SVC. So here's uh, uh, one fistulogram uh, showing a typical anastomotic uh, narrowing. Uh, uh, you can access the afflow vein and you can treat this with a four to six millimeter balloon and get a really good result. And, and this uh, patency of this anastomosis uh, probably should be one year should, you know, majority of them should be uh, patent. Here's, here's a, a graft and, and typically grafts uh, and fistulas have been treated the same way. This is a conquest balloon. These are the current technologies that are being used. Uh, this is a stent, uh, obviously a cartoon of a stent, and, a, and you can put a stent graft on it. And then now we've got drug eluting balloons that elute, uh, that have paclitaxel on it. And then we're sort of uh, uh, where I, I hope to move uh, the field is into biologics that are individualized for the patient, uh, stem cells, for example. Uh, so we had gotten interested in this. Uh, uh, we did a radiation trial when radiation was being used for uh, P, uh, PTA and coronary work. This is in the early 2000s. And we had shown that if you radiated uh, AV grafts after angioplasty, six month patency by quantitative angiography was 42% versus 0%. So this was early data in the early 2000s. Uh, Ziv Haskell did a, uh, I'm just showing you a couple papers of uh, uh, pertinent uh, uh, data. Uh, did a study looking at stent grafts versus angioplasty, and this is a New England Journal paper. Uh, his colleagues showed very similar results. Stent grafts at six months had patency rates about 50% versus 30%. So these are technologies uh, that are still used. This is uh, uh, from the late to uh, 2010, 2011 time. Remember, stent grafts in most labs are about $1,500, $1, depending on your pricing. Angioplasty balloons are anywhere, they're a commodity, $90 to $200. Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, a, 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 not a big incremental increase in restenosis at six months, but a, I would say a pretty large increase in the technology cost. So let's move forward to drug eluting balloons. This is a uh, Lutonix drug eluting balloon. Uh, this is Paclitaxel based. This is six month data that was published uh, in CJSON. And it, uh, and it showed 210 day patency of drug eluting balloons, which are about $1,500 to $2,000. The blue line for uh, 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 primary patency, 64% versus 53%. For PTA, the red line is the control arm. So about an 11% increase uh, for a pretty sizable cost in technology. This is the latest data from Medtronic that was just presented at CIRC. Uh, we were in this trial and, and their data is very similar in the control arm, 59%, the drug arm, 81.4%. This is 210, date, uh, 210 data, 210 days of da uh, data showing Kaplan-Meier improvement. The difference in the two technologies is uh, the dosing of the drug. Uh, Medtronic uses a higher drug concentration and then the excipient, uh, which is different and proprietary between the two of them. So again, showing an improvement and, and possibly a drug effect with the Medtronic data. But still, uh, uh, for the price, it may, may or may not make sense. And we're actually in the process of looking at the financial implications of this technology to a health system um, uh, that's being uh, prepared for an abstract SIR. So why am I talking about Paclitaxel? Everybody, uh, I think, probably knows that this paper came out in 2000, uh, end of 2018. Uh, in the journal American Heart and, uh, uh, Association, a meta-analysis looking at paclitaxel coded technologies in the leg. And this really was a black eye for uh, this technology because it showed uh, a uh, increase in all-cause mortality if you got paclitaxel coded technologies uh, compared to control. So this was a meta-analysis performed uh, by uh, Dr. Cost Costantinos and it really brought uh, uh, some new revelation as to why could this be happening. And uh, uh, when this happened, uh, just to give you some background, my lab has its own drug delivery uh, technology and I read this paper and at Mayo, uh, I run the endovascular uh, peripheral arterial uh, 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 team and we had moved two years ago to Paclitaxel coded technologies as our first go-to technology. And so I showed this paper, this is around, again, right before Christmas to my colleagues. And, and when I say we use it uh, at Mayo, we use it in the cath lab, we use it in surgery, we use it in radiology, we use it on all the sites. Nobody could really give me an answer for what was happening. And so over time, uh, we built consensus among the different sites and had the technology voluntarily removed in the uh, in middle of March, and which also led me to wonder, well, how could we have gotten here? And so I was really uh, intrigued by this process of how do we get from a technology that seems to work in the coronaries into the legs, meta-analysis done, and how can we as physicians have, uh, you know, uh, what, did, what could we have done wrong, and how did this technology get moved from, uh, 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 from a discovery of, of its use in cancer and so that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, walk through history that I'm not going to talk about today. But it did uh, get me intrigued enough to write a piece on it. And so I had Mike Dake help me with this and wrote a, uh, this was on my mind, I can tell you, for about four weeks. It was driving me crazy. Um, and I was lucky enough to uh, write an op-ed in circulation. It sort of walks you through the discovery of Paclitaxel as a NCI screening grant for cancer the coding of Paclitaxel onto stents by Lindsay McCann, and then moving, Lindsay McCann is an interventional radiologist in Vancouver, and then moving that technology from uh, the coding into patients. He does the first SFA stents, uh, uh, and then he starts to obviously license it into the coronaries, moving out of the coronaries, and then back into the legs, and then moving into, from legs into fistulas, where we are today. So it's sort of uh, uh, an interesting uh, walk through medical history. 
So I sort of spent the last 10, 15 minutes talking about the economic burden. And, and when I was a fellow at Hopkins, Gunnar Lund was one of my attendings. Uh, Gunnar unfortunately passed away. And Gunnar said to me, he goes, Sanjay, you know, you really like vascular biology. Why don't you study it? And I, and I was initially interested in arterial uh, disease and, and really fell into AV failure, AV fistula failure, in part because nobody in the late 90s, early 2000s was studying it uh, at, uh, at a really deep level. And so I started from uh, uh, looking at that stenosis, and this is just to give you an example, uh, Scott Nyberg is a transplant surgeon in Mayo, and this is a slide that he gave me, and this is what a PTFE graft when it's got stenosis looks like when it's planted. Uh, this is a, a gross examination, and if you look at high power uh, evaluation, the stenosis uh, is full of matrix, it's full of inflammatory cells. Uh, uh, this is the new intima that will uh, angioplasty away uh, or stent or drug a loop balloon away, but it's a thickened wall that's full of collagen uh, and, and uh, many different cells. And so uh, we started to investigate this initially by creating animal models. Uh, we were in the porcine uh, and now we have a murine model where we can do genetic alterations, where we create, uh, and I'll show you that later, uh, um, uh, but we can basically create uh, an AV fistula with chronic kidney disease superimposed and really simulate the clinical scenario. We recently published a paper uh, uh, on angioplasting, a venous stenosis in the mouse, and, and really understanding why uh, venous stenoses occur. Uh, so, uh, th and this is really, uh, I'm not going to show all the data. Uh, I wasn't sure the, it's very hard to give a talk like this uh, to such a heterogeneous uh, group of uh, physicians and scientists, but I'm going to tell you that really the reason venous stenosis uh, occurs is uh, uh, multiple factors, and I have a cartoon there, uh, and this is an AV fistula, it's an AV graft, there's proliferation, there's matrix deposition, there's uh, increased expression of smooth muscle cells and inflammatory cells that lead to a venous stenosis. And this is a cartoon I made for my first R01. And there's really multiple factors that are going on. Um, uh, th there's, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're interested in shear stress, there's increase in shear stress, there's compliance mismatch, there's hypoxic injury, there's inflammatory mediators, uh, there's uh, TGF beta signaling that's going up. And, and, and there's really, you know, proteins and genes that are being expressed uh, at different uh, locations in the vessel, whether they are in the endothelium, uh, the media, or the adventitia. Now, these have implications for therapy. Obviously, if you're, you're going to angioplasty, you're going to target endothelium and media. If you're going to do periadventitial drug delivery, which is what we do a lot of in the lab, you will target the outside of the vein. And this leads to, this is an uh, early thought of fibroblasts uh, de-differentiating into smooth muscle cells migrating and proliferating. And so this is a review article that we had written in Kidney International and it gets even more complicated because there is good shear stress, which is, allows the artery and the, and the vein to dilate. And there's bad shear stress, uh, which actually causes the stenosis to form. And if you do computational fluid uh, dynamic modeling of the anastomosis, um, uh, and, and you look at the different areas of the artery to the vein, you can see both coexisting. Uh, and, and the interesting part is the bad shear stress leads to obviously a stenosis. And this may be one of the reasons why the anastomosis is more prone to stenosis than, than say this outflow vein. And, and these are the signaling changes that will occur um, uh, in good shear stress versus bad shear stress. Now you're gonna look at that, uh, and, and I know Alan's looked at this, and he's like, well, TGF beta is on both sides. You know, some of these things show up on both sides, and, and they can be, uh, so they can be actors that behave in a good way, and they can be actors that behave in a bad way. And that sort of makes this story even more complex. MMPs are good, we've, we've thought they were bad, and they're over here on the good side, and they actually cause dilation of the vessel and positive remodeling. And so really, this is a very complex uh, uh, mechanism uh, in vascular biology. So I, I'm not that smart, so I had to have a cartoon made. Uh, and, and so this is one of the ways, this is uh, one of the ways that this may occur when a surgeon 
places a fistula, you get injury to the vasovasorum with cross clamping, and you get an increase in oxygen and hypoxia, HIP1 alpha, and then exuberation <laughs> of VEGFA and MMPs, and you get cell migration. And as cells migrate at a proportion uh, to the outward remodeling, you get what we call constrictive remodeling in a venous stenosis to form. And we know, for example, that women uh, women uh, vessels are more prone to stenosis than male vessels, and, and it's unclear what the what the sex differences in these vessels are. But that's one way a neointima may form. Now, going back to the drugs, well, where did the drugs interfere? The paclitaxel that we talked about earlier interfered in uh, tubulin inhibitor, and this is uh, in M, uh, M to G1 phase, whereas the limus is the mTORs inhibitors are in uh, the G2 phase. And so these work in the cell cycle, and they're more complicated than this. I've sort of showed a, a cartoon where they interrupt the cell cycle and interrupt the proliferation of cells. I think it's also important to understand how does drugs get delivered to the vessel wall? And, and this is important if you're gonna be trying to decide on which technology to use. And this is very complicated. Um, I, I was at a, a, a session on paclitaxel and we had engineers and scientists there and Elazar Edelman, who's probably this, one of the smartest drug delivery guys uh, was there. So uh, when he spoke to the clinicians, you could tell that the clinicians really didn't understand these concepts. How long does the drug reside? Where does it reside? Is it there weeks later, months later? And I think if you're gonna be a scientist and really study drug delivery, whether you're gonna do it in vascular biology, you're gonna do it in the oncology lab, these are things that you sort of need to understand is how much gets into the vessel, how much gets into the blood, how long does it stay there? And then does it do something bad after months have went by? And we know paclitaxel, is like super glue. Once it gets in, it resides there for a while. And really what happens is you've got a balloon, you've got a coating, you've got a drug. And as you inflate the balloon, the drug comes off of the balloon, resides in the vessel wall. And about nine to 10% of the total amount of drug will make it into the vessel wall. And this is data based on normal vessels. We don't know what that data looks like in a, in a I just showed you a histologic specimen that's full of collagen, full of uh, other things. This is normal porcine, a lot of this is in normal porcine arteries. And so, uh, uh, so this is uh, from uh, Jack and it labeled, they labeled uh, this, uh, the drug and look for the microtubules. And it really shows you seven days later, the uh, upper left uh, uh, panel is uh, plain old angioplasty and then the drug where, where it lights up into the tubulin. So you can see drug delivery into the vessel wall. And so after 60 seconds of dilation, you get about 10 to 15% of the vessel uh, 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 drug is in the wall an hour later. And so really not a lot of drug by the endothelial route. So we've talked about pathophysiology. I want to now shift into why we think stem cells are uh, a, a way forward uh, into understanding the biology and treating the biology. And, and I had gotten interested in stem cells uh, in late 2000s. And, and my interest was from watching the cardiologists use uh, endothelial cells and late outgrowth endothelial cells that were derived from the blood. And, and I'll show you some data. But I think, uh, I think there are certain advantages of stem cells, and, and I've listed a few. I think there's, uh, it's, it's really an individualized way, uh, individualized medicine to the patient. So if you use autologous-based stem cells, you can give them their own drug back. Uh, so uh, in, our, in our facility, we're using fat-derived MSCs. We're using a lot of stuff. The stuff we're using in our, uh, in, in our trial is fat-derived stem cells from the patient's own fat. There's pros and cons to that, and we can talk about that. I think there's ways of developing novel therapies for example, our surgeons in Jacksonville are using stem cells to deliver payloads for gliomas. So you can use stem cells, develop drugs or, or therapies aimed at gliomas, and basically that's your, uh, uh, your payload. Uh, I think it's also a good way to attract new patients. When we went on clinicaltrials.gov, our first patient that contacted us was in Casablanca, and he wanted to bring his wife to Mayo 
to have her evaluated for a kidney transplant, AV fistula, et cetera. And this was about two and a half years ago. Uh, I, I think this is a very innovative uh, 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 technology. And, and, and at Yale, you guys have a huge stem cell initiative. Uh, and, and there's obviously imaging uh, applications for our imaging colleagues, whether you label them uh, with a reporter gene or, uh, or a surface marker, I'll show you what we've used. So here, here's your stem cells. Uh, I just took this from your website and, and you have a stem cell center. Uh, I hope you guys, uh, I'm sure many of you know this. And, and one of the advantages of being in Connecticut, and this is the same for us in Minnesota is, that the state really started a stem cell research fund. And, and this is from me Googling. I don't know if this has been wildly successful or not. California has done this. Minnesota has done this as a partnership with the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic for And so these are really uh, state funded initiatives to uh, jumpstart research and obviously biotechnology that the uh, state is uh, uh, investing in. So again, so when you're thinking about stem cells, you know, what exactly, or how do I think about it? Um, and, and how do you unravel uh, some of the delivery uh, uh, aspects that we talked about? How do you unravel, when are you gonna deliver the cells? And then where are you gonna deliver them? And so I, I think the key, the key uh, factors are, these are four that I thought about, uh, and, I, and, I, and I usually think about with my lab is, when do you give the cells? Uh, most of our work has been for primary prevention. Uh, one of the surgeons creates a fistula. At the time of fistula creation, we want to offset the natural history of stenosis formation. Uh, and so that's what we're, we spend a lot of uh, work with, uh, whether that's with cell delivery or drug delivery. We think the adventitia has a natural advantage. Um, I, I will say with angioplasty, we think the same thing. We've done a series of experiments with angioplasty. I don't, I'm not showing the data today. Uh, with cell delivery and drug delivery to the periadventitia uh, and others have in the arterial uh, bed. And, and that, that uh, poses a, uh, a therapeutic benefit. Uh, and one of the advantages of going periadventitial is you can give a lot of drug to the area uh, uh, of injury and, and it doesn't wash out and you don't get a first pass effect like you do with endoluminal where you get some wash out of the drug or, or cells. Uh, the last, uh, the third point is autologous versus allogeneic. Uh, I think there's advantages and disadvantages. Autologous therapy, uh, 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 especially in older patients, although we haven't seen it, uh, the cells may not, they may become senescent and may not work as well as a younger donor, healthier patient. So we've, uh, 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 we have an autologous program, the IND that I have in Rochester is an autologous program. We are starting an allogenic program in, uh, uh, in um, uh, Jacksonville. They are submitting the IND. Al Hakem, who's the vascular surgeon down there and chair of surgery, is submitting an IND uh, uh, using some of our data for an allo program. And then obviously this is a huge debate uh, that I, I am not uh, even smart enough to tell you what is the right way of doing this. Where do you get the cells? Is it, are you gonna get them out of the fat, the bone marrow? And, and you can get them basically from anywhere. And then how are you gonna grow them? But I think the most important part is, can you make them in a GMP grade? Who's gonna make these things for you so you can deliver them into patients? And that's one of our competitive edges and I'll show you that in a second. And so when we, when we got interested, this is 2008, I was really interested in blood outgrowth endothelial cells. And we did this in my lab where we did, uh, we took blood from pigs, grew out cells and delivered them back uh, to uh, the pigs. So autologous ba uh, based therapy. And uh, this was the cartoon. This is not uh, scientifically uh, the exact way of doing it but this is the way we could do it with limited resources. We created uh, uremia in the pigs by embolizing a kidney and a half in CKD. And uh, four weeks later, four to four weeks later, we took a nano PLGA scaffolding and wrapped it with cells versus just a nano PLGA uh, scaffolding, or uh, I'm sorry, just a scaffolding. It did MRI, followed the pigs for two weeks. And, and we found was that the histology was different. The controls are on the right. And this shows you that there's a neointimal thickness. This is what it looks like in a pig. By the way, the pig looks a lot different than the mouse. 
and this is where we gave the cell. So there was a cell effect in a group of six pigs. If you quantified it, uh, it was significant. So, and this is what the summary, I'm not gonna, uh, I, I promised uh, uh, Kevin I would keep the biology uh, at, a, uh, at a minimum. Uh, but what we found was that you could transplant BOEC and reduce stem cells. And it was through a, a decrease in HIF1 alpha and, and MMP9, but we really didn't know we really didn't know how it worked. And more importantly, we really couldn't move forward in a methodical way into patients because we didn't have a GMP grade. So we did some other experiments with co-culture because I really thought that this was a viable therapy, uh, understanding uh, if, if the cells could impact hypoxia-mediated fibroblast and myofibroblast conversion. And this is in a, in, in a journal of ASPA research. And we, what we did was we did uh, co-culture experiments between two cells, uh, the blood aspirate endothelial cells and fibrox, fibroblasts, excuse me, and made them hypoxia and normoxia and looked at cytokine changes, uh, smooth muscle cell actin changes, proliferation and migration. And what we found out was that there grew a character in effect that the fibroblasts, uh, when you had them with uh, BOEC, really worked, uh, we thought, maybe through a TGF-beta pathway and decreased alpha-SMA uh, production. And, and that might be how they worked in, in our pigs. And, and there was a reduction in uh, 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 proliferation and some of these different cytokines uh, under uh, these conditions. So this was all exciting. And uh, time went by and, and we stumbled upon Mike Conti and, and other investigators' paper on how they used allogeneic endothelial cell implants. And they actually did what we had done in pigs. They had targeted the periadventitia and it really invigorated me. Uh, I was in the middle of my second, uh, my first renewal uh, and looking for new ways of really moving our science forward. And, and there's a couple things that happen. I come across this paper in this trial. I see that AV fistulas and AV grafts are an area of interest. And then also at Mayo, we had started to uh, uh, create a stem cell uh, initiative and a center for stem cell and regenerative medicine. And so again, uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, uh, in my mind, the ideal cell therapy is autologous. Uh, obviously, GMP, uh, if you can get large amounts of cells, and, and at least for AV fistulas, I haven't shown you a lot of uh, our own animal data but we think it's any inflammatory and anti proliferative properties are very important. So Mayo started to work on stem cell therapy um, in 2004 and five. Uh, so I've sort of walked you up to about 2011 of what my lab was doing. And Mayo started to look at stem cells as a way of uh, providing uh, a, a tool that could help patients. And the first work was done in 0405 with multiple animal studies uh, in different species, mice and pigs, and SOPs were developed. And the first patient was treated in 2010. And to date, we've got uh, 251 patients treated in 375 doses. This is all around MSC, so I'm lucky. I work with a lab, it's called the Impact Lab, and they basically create stem cells in a clinical grade product that can be brought to the cath lab I mean, I'm involved in four or five INDs where we're delivering stem cells into renal arteries with and without stenosis, with stenting. We have a new IND that's being developed for inflammatory bowel disease. We're going to inject stem cells into the IMA uh, for left colon disease. Uh, we have uh, another IND for uh, uh, diabetic kidney disease, and so infusing stem cells. And then my own uh, work, and I'm trying to get our NIR uh, interventional neuro people uh, to think about stroke. And so there's four or five, uh, obviously there's more applications, CLI, for example, with and without revascularization uh, for uh, uh, lower extremity critical limb ischemia. These are all obviously vascular based. I'm not talking about any cancer or other things, uh, um, uh, but, but in the vascular space, these are planned or doing trials. So just to give you an idea, where are, are we really this uh, 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 profound? Or are we doing this many trials? So I had our impact guy send me this. And so we're doing 17 trials, 15 are currently enrolling, 15 allo, two, uh, uh, excuse me, 15 auto, two allo, and it sort of tells you most are unmodified cells. 
And it gives you sort of, uh, I, I was looking at this, and so it's really, uh, you know, some cancer work up here, uh, uh, neurogenic uh, 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 problems. Uh, I told you about the kidney disease. I told you about uh, a little bit about IBD. They also have a Crohn's-related uh, fistula where they've coated cells, uh, and, and our uh, GI folks are coating cells onto sutures and using them to close uh, fistulas with our GI surgeons. And you can sort of see uh, our... Uh, 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 osteoarthritis is a huge thing, and our, uh, the other people that are using this is in PMR and orthopedic surgery. And this sort of shows you that you can, uh, it gives you the demographics and the range of patients that they've isolated cells and the doubling time. And, and, and we're basically able to isolate cells uh, in our patient population, the average age of 65, and we've been able to isolate cells from uh, essentially everybody uh, that we've been uh, enrolling in our trial. And this is really the release uh, testing that they use. Uh, uh, there's a plastic adherence, differentiation, phenotype, sterility. The problem we've seen is uh, uh, we've had one or two where we isolate cells, they get an abnormal karyotype, we go and isolate again, and that karyotype is gone. Uh, but in general, uh, the feasibility of MSCs in our hands using GMP grade material in this lab is uh, 98%. So I wanted to set that up because the rest of the uh, lecture is going to be about using these stem cells. Um, and so when, when I saw this work that was being done, I got interested in this. And the first uh, set of uh, experiments that we did was we took human stem cells into skid mice and wanted to see if there was a response. And uh, this is a paper in the Great Journal that was published a few years ago. Uh, um, that we've really uh, moved forward with, uh, with additional data where we've taken uh, 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 cells from inbred mice into mice uh, and, and, and recapitulated the same results. And, and what this uh, uh, technology, the way it was done is we have a mouse uh, AVF model where we correct, uh, connect the carotid artery to the jugular vein and we would coat the anastomosis with stem cells. And we would use labeling with zirconium-89 uh, to label the cells. The other uh, way that we've thought about this is a NIST reporter gene, uh, which will uh, report the, uh, uh, the activity of the cells. Uh, so this is zirconium-89 in mice, and you can get really nice pictures if you want uh, of the activity of the mice after delivery. We've seen cells out. For, uh, cells that are hot uh, and the zirconium signal out up to 18 days. Um, and so, uh, uh, again, we do a, a lot of our work by histology uh, measurements. And so this is control uh, uh, fistulas in the same mice. These are MSC delivered uh, uh, mice. And you can see there's a difference in the histology. This is an H and E showing the difference in the neointimal thickness. Uh, which is demarcated by the dots, and you can quantify uh, these measurements, um, uh, and you can see a difference in lumen vessel area. So uh, white is uh, the MSCs, and, and bl uh, 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 black is uh, uh, controls. And you can see that there's a difference in the neo to media adventitia ratio. These are suggesting that the MSCs have positive remodeling. We've done these set of experiments in porcine pigs as well. And so really validated in three different systems, uh, initially starting with skid mice, moving into mice, into mice uh, uh, that had full inflammatory response, and then into uh, pigs, and seen pretty much very similar results. Um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, the way we think this works is MSC transplantation uh, uh, decreases MCP1 gene expression and decreases proliferation, uh, promotes increase in cell death and uh, decrease in these markers that are uh, 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 leading to uh, positive remodeling. So this is a sort of what's used. This data along with some other data from our own institution was used to obtain an IND. Uh, and so this whole process that I'm telling you uh, sort of give you an idea started in the mice work started in 2014. Uh, it got published in 2016, 2015. IND got written right after that using our mouse data. Uh, uh, and there was a physician IND that, that I wrote uh, with the help of our partners in manufacturing the cells. 
And, and we sort of thought about how can we test this therapy forward uh, very methodically. And so, uh, uh, as many of you know, in order to get a fistula or a graft, there's vein mapping done. And what we really wanted to see was could we prevent this stenosis, the stenosis that forms at the fistula anastomosis. And there was a couple of reasons we thought this would be the most advantageous area to deliver cells. We could see this surgically when the surgeon uh, uh, created the anastomosis. We could deliver the cells with, with uh, pretty, pretty good certainty that they got to where we were going. And, and we were uh, able to get large amounts of AMSCs that I've shown you earlier. And so what would happen is patients would come in uh, and they would get randomized if they agreed to either cells or no cells based on uh, vein mapping. And, and we used a randomization that took age and gender into account and also anatomic location. So you got randomized for radiocephalic fistula versus brachiocephalic. And we did uh, ultrasound. We had our ultrasound colleagues ultrasound the anastomosis. So the anastomosis is about five CMs, and they would do four different measurements to see what the vascular remodeling after cell delivery is. And our hypothesis was that if you got cells, maturation would go up, your patency would get better and your blood flow would increase. And so this is uh, sort of the big uh, uh, inclusion criteria. We included pre-dialysis or dialysis patients, uh, 18 to 85, uh, uh, new planned AVF, and it could be these two. We've now moved into two stages. Initially, uh, uh, our, our next uh, set of patients will be two-stage fistulas, but really uh, haven't enrolled anybody. And the dose was based on a surface area calculation uh, which is written out here. We, uh, after the anastomosis, uh, we would measure the radius and, and figure out how, uh, how much surface area to the vessel there was, and then deliver cells over five minutes. And these cells, I, I've never told you this, but this, uh, up until now, this is what the phenotype of these cells are that we're getting. Uh, they're 70, CD73 positive, CD90 positive, CD105 positive, CD44 positive, and HLA ABC positive. So this is the phenotype of the cells that are isolated from the patient's um, uh, uh, autologous based. And so how does this work? Uh, here's a cartoon of how the cells are isolated. So it's really liposuction. You make a little incision in the groin and you can isolate uh, uh, large amounts of, uh, uh, of fat and the fat is grown out in, uh, in a Petri dish. And, and really, uh, whether it's a mouse, a pig, humans, these cells grow real rapidly, and in about seven to 10 days, you have more cells uh, than you need, and then they get purified and checked for sterility. I showed you some of the release uh, uh, criteria, and then a portion of them are uh, uh, saved for uh, delivery, and then another portion are saved in case uh, something were to happen to the patient down the road that they're all biobanked. Um, and so how does, how do we, uh, 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 this is our first patient that we treated, so this is almost two years ago. This is a, a planned brachiocephalic fistula. Randy DiMartino is one of my vascular surgeon colleagues, uh, 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 treated this patient. And in the OR, this is what the uh, fistula looks like. We would do a calculation uh, of the dose that we needed, and then he would administer the dose to the periadventitia adventitia by gently uh, uh, spraying it onto the vein over five minutes. And so uh, uh, this is uh, another, this is a cartoon uh, that I'll sort of walk you through it. This is a radiocephalic fistula and the fistula has been created and, and uh, we uh, do the measurement and then you can deliver the cells. I, I know this doesn't look very eloquent, uh, but it actually it works because these cells are very sticky and, and you really don't need much more than just very simple way of delivering them, which is remarkable. Uh, so how long do these cells hang around? I sort of told you this earlier. Uh, zirconium-89 uh, is one way of looking at them. We've looked at them with GFP labeled, and this was in our earlier data in mice, and now we've seen cells up to four weeks later that are residing in the vessel wall. You can take MSCs and uh, uh, label them with GFP and then look for the green uh, this is control versus uh, 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 MSC delivered from our paper earlier. And so where are we today? Uh, uh, we've now enrolled uh, uh, 23 patients. Uh, so we, were, uh, we committed ourselves to a phase one trial where we wanted 22 patients and follow them for a year. Uh, this is a little bit of an old slide. I think we've hit 23 already. So we've got 23 patients enrolled. 
uh, uh, that uh, are going to go from beginning to end with one year follow up. We've had um, uh, we had a total of 30 when we started. 21 patients got enrolled. We had some screen failures in the OR where two patients. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, the surgeon, based on AV uh, fistula vein mapping, said it's going to be radiocephalic couldn't do it, had to go to a different arm uh, or different location. So that's what screen failure is. We sort of modified our protocol for that scenario. I, I told you a little bit about this abnormal karyotype. Uh, we had two patients that had an abnormal karyotype. We've, uh, uh, what we've done is modified our protocol to do a second biopsy and see if that uh, results in a, uh, a normal karyotype. And then, so we've got good data on 16 patients. They've completed the whole trial up to one year, uh, you can see how far long, uh, uh, 1.32 years mean follow-up. And, and these are the locations uh, that we've treated, radiocephalics, brachiocephalic, and it gives you a sort of an average amount of cells, about 4 million cells that we're using. And so can this really, you know, this is just some ultrasound data. I don't know if there's ultrasound people here. Uh, I love my ultrasound people because they have to, really do uh, six, uh, six ultrasounds for me. And, and, and we get the anastomosis laid out from the artery to the vein, and we measure in four different locations just for the cell delivery. And then we have our clinical uh, uh, part of the uh, ultrasound that's done also measuring the outflow veins and, and the blood flow like we would clinically. And you can get beautiful pictures. And so this is sort of our core lab uh, equivalent of measuring the anastomosis and seeing how it's uh, remodeling over time. And I'm just showing you a couple of snapshots of this. Uh, so this is, you know, to do this uh, uh, as a radiologist or an interventional radiologist, it's very hard. I've had a tremendous amount of, uh, of help. Uh, uh, that's probably an understatement. Um, Kevin can tell you I need a lot of help because he worked with me as a fellow. Uh, I've had a lot of help from the surgeons, uh, vascular surgeons and transplant surgeons. They both do fistulas our nephrologists uh, and our regenerative folks, and then obviously our radiology uh, colleagues. Um, uh, and so wh where do I think the future is? I, I sort of alluded to this allogeneic trial. Uh, so we've started that. And then I think the other one is uh, into angioplasty, um, uh, angioplasty-based technology for stem cells, especially now that we don't know what's going to happen with drug-coded technologies. That was our best technology that we had. Um, uh, we're, we're also looking at how does this work. We're doing some uh, uh, xenografting with uh, cells into mice to understand the mechanism. We biobank all the cells. Uh, um, and we biobank some uh, monocytes and vein tissue. And so we sort of have all of this saved uh, for future direction. I'll leave you with this. Uh, so this was, I, I sort of alluded to this. We created a venous stenosis angioplasty model in a mouse for uh, testing these therapies. And the way we did this is we create CKD uh, uh, in mice by doing a nephrectomy, uh, a 7-H remnant or nephrectomy and tying off the upper pole. The BUN and creat uh, uh, creatinines go up in the mice. Four weeks later, we create an anastomosis and we take the juggler vein uh, from the right side and, and move it over to the left carotid and really elongate it. Wait two weeks and a stenosis forms and you can see this by Doppler. We, we have a Doppler now where we can do Doppler measurements. And then we do, uh, uh, two weeks later, we puncture the vein operatively. And here's the pictures under a uh, operating microscope. Uh, and we dilate this using a coronary uh, angioplasty balloon from Medtronic. The vein is uh, dilated to 1.2 millimeters uh, using this coronary angioplasty balloon. And you can really simulate the clinical scenario Stenosis forms, you dilate it, you can treat at the time of dilation, and then follow the animal's longitudinal. Uh, so this is really a way of really understanding the biology, whether that's related to uh, uh, the drugs or the stem cells. So how do we think this is all happening? Uh, going back to that cartoon I showed you earlier, so we have some injury. This is in uh, uh, for AV fistulas and the clinical trial. We introduce MSCs. And, and these MSCs have uh, uh, magical properties where they uh, uh, work through paracrine uh, mechanisms and they uh, are very anti-inflammatory and they can uh, basically retard the inflammatory response through an MCP uh, pathway 
and, and decreased proliferation and migration of cells leading to a stenosis. So that's a real uh, 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 one possible mechanism. I'm sure there's others, uh, uh, but this is one way that we think these cells are working. Uh, and then this is, uh, these are the people uh, that have worked on this. Uh, I want to give, uh, this is my, uh, Dr. Kai is one of my surgeons who's really been uh, highly innovative in the lab, created the mouse PTA model and did a lot of the work. Sri does a lot of my cell therapy work and, and some other people over the years. Vin Shaw uh, uh, had done the original mouse work in my lab and, and that has moved on. Uh, but this this is sort of the people. This is the uh, collaborators, and you can see we work with a bunch of different people, uh, drug delivery people in MIT and Urbana. Uh, I didn't show you we have a drug delivery platform uh, and other technologies. I, I, I will tell you that one of the beautiful things about studying uh, biology is it doesn't limit your brain. Uh, we have a model for kidney injury after contrast. And we also have an AVM model that looks a little bit like HHT. Um, uh, and these are the funding uh, sources that we've had uh, over the years. Thank you. I'll stop there.